Good morning. For our call to worship this morning, I'd like to read from Psalms 92, verses 1 through 4. It says this, It is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord, and to sing praises to thy name, O Most High, to declare thy loving kindness in the morning, and thy faithfulness by night, with the ten-string lute, and with the harp, with the resounding music upon the lyre. For thou, O Lord, hast made me glad by what thou hast done. I will sing for joy at thy works of thy hands. We would like to welcome you to the Albernet Christian Church this morning. Some announcements that we'd like to highlight. Um, I believe that Betty had her 90th birthday this last week. And so um, if you would like to send her a, a well wish or a birthday card or something, I've included her address down there on the entryway and the bulletin board. So happy birthday to you. Um, and it's good to see that you have some family with you here this morning as well. We would also like to remind everybody that our next congregational meeting will be next Sunday following the morning worship service. There'll be no carry-in dinner. Um, it'll be just like the last one that we did. We'll allow people that want to leave to leave. We'll allow everyone to kind of remain socially distanced in their pews. We'll just have the congregational meeting right upstairs here. And when it is done, we'll just go our separate ways. So that'll be next Sunday. Um, are there any other announcements that we need to mention at this time? Any others? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our great and our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, we're thankful for the day that you've given to us. We're thankful for your love and for your grace and for your mercy. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you be with the Rollinger family as they've lost not one but two people in their family um, suddenly. And Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would just come alongside them and that you'd help them to feel your presence and to know that you're there with them. And Heavenly Father, that you just carry them in their grief. I ask that you be surely as she uh, goes into the oral surgeon next month and she has this lump looked at and taken care of that's in her mouth. We just pray, Lord, that um, they would be able to get that figured out and they'd bring a resolution for her. And Heavenly Father, I just pray that they'd be able to figure out what's going on with my knee. We have so many that need your very real and very special touch. We just ask that you'd move in a mighty way and that you bring victory to your people. All these things we ask and we pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. For our first hymn this morning, let's stand and we'll sing hymn number 319, Wonderful Grace of Jesus, all three verses. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise be? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Reaching to all the lost By it I have been pardoned Saved to the uttermost Chains have been torn asunder Giving me liberty For the wonderful grace of Jesus <coughs> Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than <coughs> the conditions, 
more than all my sin and shame. Magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled by its transforming power, making Him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, and the wonderful grace of the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame, oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. You may be seated. For our next hymn, we'll sing hymn number 305, and we'll sing the first, the second, and the third verse of the love of God. love of God is greater for than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest store and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son to win his erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from his sin. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. When hoary time shall pass away, and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who hear refuse to pray, on rocks and hills and mountains call. God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong. Redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and day. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Could we with think the ocean fill? skies of parchment made, where every stalk on earth a quill, on every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll Contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, 
how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song then we'll turn over to hymn number 268 we'll sing christ the lord is risen today first second and fourth verse Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high, hallelujah. Sing ye heavens and earth reply, Alleluia. Lives again our glorious King, Alleluia. Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting, Alleluia. Dying once, he all the save, Alleluia. Where thy victory, O grave, Alleluia. So we now, where Christ has led, Alleluia. Following our exalted head, Alleluia. Made like Him, like Him we rise, Alleluia. Ours across the grave, the skies, Alleluia. God's children say amen. Amen. All God's children say amen. Amen. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women came with their came to the sepulchre and had prepared the certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you in, the, in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Luke 24 verses 1 through 7. The tomb, the tomb could not hold Jesus on the third day. He rose from the dead. His resurrection is the central event in human history. Because Jesus lives, his followers are beyond measure. God sent his only son to die for our sins. We in turn should approach our heavenly father with humility, with reverence, and with thanksgiving. But sometimes amid the crush of our everyday responsibilities, we don't stop long enough to pause and thank our creator for his blessings. When we slow down and express our gratitude to the one who made us, we enrich our own lives and the lives of those around us. Thankful believers like you see the need to praise God with sincerity, with humility, and with consistency. So this morning, as we come to the communion table, may we open our hearts and thank our Creator for all the gifts that he has given to us. And may we use those gifts to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone 
here and around the world. So let's brother come to the Lord's table by singing at the cross. We'll sing the first, the second verse, standing on that fourth verse. again for this opportunity to gather in your house and as we do so I pray that our hearts and minds will be focused on Calvary and that we never forget the tremendous pain and suffering both physically and emotionally that your one and only son uh, endured for the forgiveness of our sins we thank you for all the many blessings that we've had the most importantly we thank you for the love you have shown each and every one of us so much that you gave up your only son to die for our sins. Bless this loaf which represents his broken body. Bless the cup, his spilled blood. Guide us, direct us, and protect us in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray.
We certainly live in interesting times, don't we? I recently saw a post on Facebook, and um, it said, to whoever it is out there that keeps saying that 2020 can't possibly get any worse, will you please be quiet? <laughs> What do you do when the laws of the land violate your religious convictions? Melanie and I know personally somebody in Missouri who a while back was refusing to grant same-sex marriage licenses on the grounds that it violated her religious beliefs. Others struggle in doctor's offices and pharmacies when asked to prescribe or sell the morning after pill. We've already seen what happens to florists and bakeries that refuse to service, who refuse service to people who choose different lifestyles than the Bible deems acceptable. Why is it okay to refuse service to someone who wants the Confederate flag on his cake, but absolutely dare not refuse service to a same-sex couple? Or why is it okay when uh, people refuse to uh, serve Sarah Huckabee because she was associated with Donald Trump at a restaurant, but not anybody else? Why is one okay, but not the other? Um, my sister was telling me that... <clears throat> In all of the Black Lives Matter stuff that we have recently gone through, there was a city where people had painted Black Lives Matter, and that was perfectly acceptable, and that was okay, until somebody painted Black Unborn Lives Matter, and then suddenly that was not okay. Why is it that it's okay only part of the time but not all the time? Why is it okay to say that black lives matter, but not socially acceptable to say that all lives matter? I'd like to look this morning at someone in the Bible who found himself in a similar situation, in a place where... His religious convictions were being compromised by the political landscape that he found himself in. So turn with me, if you will, to Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. It says this, Darius, who is king, thought it would be a good idea to choose 120 governors who would rule his kingdom. He chose three men as supervisors over those governors, and Daniel was one of those supervisors. The supervisors were to ensure that the governors did not try to cheat the king. Daniel showed that he could do the work better than any of the other supervisors and governors, so the king planned to put Daniel in charge of the whole kingdom. Because of this, the other supervisors and governors tried to find reason to accuse Daniel about his work in the government. But they could not find anything wrong with him or any reason to accuse him because he was trustworthy and not lazy or dishonest. Man, wouldn't it be awesome if we could say that about the people that serve us in Washington today? That they're, if we tried to find something that we could not find any corruption in them or any laziness or any untrustworthiness in them whatsoever? That is a tremendous statement, isn't it, about Daniel's life? Finally, these men said, We will never find any reason to accuse Daniel unless it's about the law of his God. So the supervisors and governors went as a group to the king and said, King Darius, live forever. The supervisors, assistant governors, governors, the king who advise you, and the captains and the soldiers have all agreed that you should make a new law for everyone to obey. For the next 30 days, no one should pray to any god or human except to you, O king. 
Anyone who doesn't obey will be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, make the law and sign your name to it so that it cannot be changed. Then it will be a law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be canceled or revoked. So the king signed the law. Even though Daniel knew that the law, new law had been written, he went to pray in an upstairs room in his house, which, he had, which had windows that opened toward Jerusalem. Three times each day, Daniel would kneel down and pray and thank God just as he always had done. Then those men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and talked to him about the law that he had made. They said, didn't you sign a law that said no one may pray to any god or human except you, O king? Doesn't it say that anyone who disobeys during the next 30 days will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, yes, that is the law, and the law of the Medes and Persians cannot be canceled. Then they said to the king, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is not paying attention to you, O king, or to the law that you signed. Daniel still prays to his God three times every day. The king became very upset when he heard this. He wanted to save Daniel, and he worked very hard until sunset trying to think of a way to save him. Now, what I want you to understand is that for Daniel, when the king passed this law, Daniel didn't change his behavior in any way. Daniel hadn't been praying in private. He continued to pray the way that he always did. He always had the windows open. He always prayed three times a day as he faced toward Jerusalem. He just, and when this law came out, Daniel didn't suddenly close the windows and hide in the cellar to pray. He continued to do that which he had always done. He didn't change his behavior at all. What I the reason I say that is that I don't want you guys to get this impression that Daniel here is showing some sort of defiance to the king. You know, um, Daniel is not saying here, you know, I'm doing this strictly to defy the king because he's being dumb. Daniel is continuing to follow his religious convictions that he has always followed. And the king here is clearly deceived, right? I mean, he should have, you know, in my mind, he should have wondered why these guys were like coming up to him and saying, oh, you're so wonderful. You're so great. We should only worship you for the next 30 days. Uh, you know, that would have made me wonder what in the world's going on. But apparently not. Darius thought, hey, that's a great idea. And so he signs this law that he cannot revoke. But Darius liked Daniel very, very much. Now, Daniel is, um, is a, he's getting up in age. You know, I'm not exactly sure how old Daniel is, but Daniel's an old man, right? Because um, you have to understand that when he went into captivity as a young man, he went into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar, right? And so he served under Nebuchadnezzar. He served briefly under Nebuchadnezzar's son. Now he is serving under Darius, which is an entirely different kingdom that came in and took over Babylon. So in one night, the nation of Babylon falls to the Medes and the Persians. And Darius is a Mede. He has become the king over Babylon because they have subdued it. And so there's a lot of years here that have progressed. There are three things that I think that we can see as we look at Daniel this morning. And that first is this, that he was a man of integrity. Daniel was a man of integrity. In Daniel 6, 4 through 5, it says, At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. 
Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charge against this man unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these guys are jealous because King Darius wants to elevate Daniel to being in control of all of these guys, right? Second in control only to King Darius himself. And it kind of reminds me of this story that my older sister once told me. Okay, you have to understand in my family, there are four of us, my youngest sister was the perfect child. Never did anything wrong, never got spankings. I mean, she was like so perfect that this one time my mom took her to a vacation Bible school meeting, like where the teachers get together and they're trying to decide what they're going to do for curriculum and stuff and everything. And Chrissy is really little and she's being kind of noisy. And, you know, my mom turns to her and says, shh, you know, you're being naughty. And she got so upset, she breaks out in tears. She starts sobbing and says, I'm not naughty, Mommy. I'm not naughty. You know, just the idea that she had upset my mom just, you know, put her beside herself, right? Perfect child. Not me. <laughs> no, oh, obviously not my sister as well, because my older sister one day, she is in trouble. She's been sent to her room. She's sitting on the bed. And she's contemplating the trouble that she has gotten into, right? And she thinks a little bit about her younger sister. And she said, you know, I really should be more like Chrissy. And she sat there and she goes, nah. <laughs> right? I mean, that kind of reminds me of these guys here. Right? They have looked at Daniel, they're, up, they're jealous of Daniel, they're upset at Daniel, and they, they should be saying, you know what, I should be more like Daniel. Instead, they're going, nah, <laughs> let's just get rid of him. Right? So, um, Daniel is this guy of great integrity. And Daniel did the right thing, even when nobody was looking. I mean, can you imagine if somebody were to say of you that the only way that we could ever get anything against this person is if it has to do with their worship of God? That they're so committed to their God that they would never compromise anything that he's asked them to do. Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, if your life spoke that kind of a witness to the rest of the world? Because that's exactly what Daniel's life was doing. He did the right thing even when no one was looking. And even Daniel's enemies knew that Daniel's God came first. That if it came down to King Darius or his worship of God, even his enemies knew that he would choose his worship of God over his, his position, over his friendship with Darius, over his own well-being, even his own life. Because I'm sure he had read the decree. Daniel was aware of what the decree was, that anyone found worshiping anyone other than Darius would be thrown to the lion's. And yet, it didn't change his behavior at all. Secondly, we see that Daniel was a man of conviction. He was a man of conviction. In Daniel 6, 10 through 11, it says this, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room, where his windows opened toward heaven or toward Jerusalem, three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done. And I think the key that I want to look at there is that next verse word before. Just as he had done before. This is not new behavior. He is continuing the behavior that he has always done. Nothing's changing here. 
regardless of the consequences. Daniel didn't try to hide his faith. I mean, if we were honest, how many of us would have continued to pray, but we'd have shut the windows? I mean, and we would have said to ourselves, there's no sense in attracting undue attention here. Nothing's going on here. Close the windows. Go into the bedroom. Still going to pray. But see, Daniel didn't change anything. He continued to do what he always did. Because he knew that what he was doing was right. The question that I have to ask is this. How often do we kind of compromise our convictions and our principles? I mean, we might not come right out and, you know, entirely abandon them, but we would have closed the windows. I mean, we, we still would have prayed we, to God. We wouldn't have prayed to Darius, but we just would have made sure we did it when nobody was looking. When, it's been a long time ago, I saw an interview with Joel Olstein, and the reporter specifically asked Joel Olstein how what he believed the Bible had to say about homosexuality. And I'm telling you, he tried to dance around that question every way. I, you know, he first started out with, I believe that God loves all people, you know, and then he said something else, and then he said something else. But this reporter continued to press him until finally he said, I believe that the Bible indicates that homosexuality is wrong. But he only admitted it when he was given no corner and forced into a corner with nowhere else to go. You see what I'm saying? That he, that, you know, every response tried to avoid the question instead of actually tell you what he actually truly believed or felt. Okay? Now, I applaud Joel Olstein that he finally admitted that the Bible says that homosexuality is wrong. But what I'm saying here is, how much has he compromised his convictions in his attempt to try and make it palatable to everybody? I mean, you can water something down so much that it no longer really means anything at all. And there's churches in America today where we've done that. We've watered the gospel down to the point where it really doesn't mean much at all. Daniel, he stood by his convictions. And Daniel refused to obey men over God. He refused to do it. So what happens when, I don't say if, because I think it will eventually happen, given the, the social environment and climate that we're in, what happens when uh, government mandates that regardless of how you believe, churches must marry any couple that wants to be married. What happens when um, saying that marriage is between one man and one woman and anything different violates God's plan for marriage what happens when that becomes termed as hate speech and you can be thrown in jail for it? Do we just quit talking about it? Do we just avoid that conversation altogether and just pretend that those verses don't exist in the Bible? Or do we continue to do what we have always done and say that God loves all people 
but there are things that we can do that violate God's law. Understand here, when I use this example, I'm using it because it is one of the hot buttons in our society today. Lying is every bit as much a sin as homosexuality. Stealing is every, much, every bit as much a sin as homosexuality. Murder, every bit as much a sin as homosexuality. Sin is sin. Regar- you know, we're the ones who have bad sins and not so bad sins. All sin is violating God's law and it's in subordination to him, right? So I'm not standing here this morning and saying that homosexuality is any better or any worse than any other sin. I'm just simply saying as far as God is concerned, it is sin, right? Do we ignore it because it's become unpopular to talk about it? Or do we continue like Daniel to do what we have always done and say, when, when it needs to be addressed, this is the way it is. How about another one that we don't like to talk about at all? What about church discipline? What about when there are people that are coming to church that we know are living in sin? Do we just pretend that it's not there? See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, or... Or do we address it like the Bible says? Where we go to them in private, right? And we say, this is not, this is not what God's word says. There's, we have, there's a problem here, right? And then if, if that takes care of it, we're cool. Everything is great. But if it doesn't, then we go with someone who can confirm all the things that we're seeing, Right? That's unpopular. I mean, churches are supposed to be loving and accepting, right? But the Bible's clear that, you know, unrepentant sin in the church, there's no place for it. You know, in the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira, they, people were, were going and they were selling their property and they were giving everything that they had to the church and the church was using that to help people, right? So Ananias and Sapphira, they go out, they sell this piece of land that they have and they give part of that money to the church. Now there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. The problem was that they told the apostles and the church that that was all of the money that they got from the sale that they gave everything to the church. The problem was that they lied not only to the apostles, but they were lying to the Holy Spirit, right? And they died. And that seems really super harsh. But the church is designed that it can take a lot of abuse from the outside, but not very much from within. And you know, our nation is kind of like that too. When, when we're attacked from the outside, as American people, we stand together. Right? If you want to destroy America, you won't do it with tanks and bombs. You'll do it from inside, from the Senate and the Congress. If you really want to destroy America, that's how it'll happen not from an army because America will stand together. And church is kind of the same way. Thirdly, Daniel was able to make a difference. He was able to make a difference. In Daniel 6, 25 through 28, it says, And King Darius wrote to all the people. So Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. The lions don't eat him, right? And so Darius comes early in the morning and he calls down into this pit with the lions. And he says, Daniel, was your God able to save you from the lions? And Daniel calls up and says, yes, yes, he was. So he has Daniel pulled out of the lion's pit. 
And all of these guys that tried to frame Daniel are thrown into the lion's den. The Bible says that the guys don't even hit the ground before the lions attack them, right? They're hungry. And so um, that brings us here to Daniel 6, 25 through 28. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land, may you prosper greatly. I issued a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heaven and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. What would have happened if Daniel would have hid in his closet and prayed? Probably nothing. But then we'd have never seen God move in a mighty way. Because Daniel was willing to act on his faith, we get this fantastic story of how God delivered him and how the king issues a decree to all of Medo-Persia that says, hey, you need to worship this God of Daniel's. Because he is faithful. Probably every one of us has seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Where, you know, um, the guy decides that he's more valuable because of his life insurance policy, dead than alive. And so Clarence, the angel, goes to show him that what his life would have been like if he was never born. And how it affected so many other people. There was another movie that was uh, put out that was called Mr. Destiny, I think it was. And uh, this man in high school misses this pitch. It's like the championship game. It's two outs. The count is full. He's standing at the, at the plate. The bases are loaded. If he can only hit the ball, the team will win, right? And he swings and strikes out. And he spends the rest of his life wondering what would have happened if I would only have hit that ball. And then in this movie, he gets the chance to find out. And he finds out that while, you know, initially it seemed wonderful, that it affected so many other aspects of his life. The, he doesn't end up marrying the same woman that he married, you know, and um, the the he tries to find the woman that he was married to in his previous life, and she's afraid that he's a stalker and all kinds of crazy stuff, right? And, and eventually, he, at the end of the movie, he's wishing for his old life back. You know, the thing is, for each and every one of us, we never know how our actions will affect the rest of the world around us. You know, what is true in It's a Wonderful Life may be actually true of every single one of us because of the lives that we come into contact with and that we impact and that we change. And then the difference that we make. Can you imagine how history would have been different if there would have been somebody who would have alerted Pearl Harbor and warn them of the incoming invasion? What if somebody had uh, assassinated Hitler before he was able to rise to power? What kind of a difference would that one single event have made in all of history? The thing is, none of us know which events in our life can be that one event on which all of history pivots. And so it's important that we live our life with purpose every single day. What if you are the person who shares the faith that's inside of you that converts the next Billy Graham? It could certainly happen. Or you're the person who influences the next Mother Teresa 
to do what she does with her life. I had a, a different, you know, Daniel made a difference because he stood for what was right. I'm out of time, so I'm going to skip some of the stuff that I got here. Because of Daniel's faith, God was glorified. So that's kind of the next sub-point that I got there. And finally, and this is kind of what we've been talking about, your actions may have a huge impact on those who are around you. You just never know. I mean, you may be the person who convinces somebody that their life is worth living and talk them out of committing suicide, and you never even know it. I had a different illustration that I was going to end with this morning. I'm going to use a different one this morning than I had in my notes. So, Shelly, you can't use it, sorry. Um, but there was no slides that went with it anyway. I was recently this week told a story. <clears throat> and since I don't have permission, I didn't specifically ask for permission to use it, all of the people in the, my story will remain anonymous. But I know these people... I know that the story is true. This is absolutely a true story. So um, a church down in Missouri that will remain unnamed, uh, there was a family that went there. And that family had a terrible tragedy that took place in which their house burned to the ground and the father was killed in the house. Everything that was in the house was lost, including a very a special violin that the mom played. She was an excellent violinist. She played this violin. And um, not only did she lose her husband, not only did the kids lose their father, but everything that they owned, even the precious things like the pictures, the violin, everything was destroyed in this fire as well. And um, the backstory behind the, the tragedy is even sadder, but I'm not going to go into it. So... Um, somebody that had went to church with her knew that she did not have her violin anymore. And she had a violin, and so she loaned her violin to her to play. And when this lady got ready to move out of state, she returned the violin back to the lady that had loaned it to her. Well, this lady... Um, she has this huge heart for people. And she absolutely believes this verse in Psalms that says that when you help people who are in need, that God will in turn bless you. That he will repay you when you help people who are unable to repay you back. And so she had done this project and she had gotten four or $500. And so she thought she would really, really like to purchase a violin for her in some way to try and help for all of this loss that she had incurred, the loss of her husband, the loss of her home. You know, the ins they were having to fight with the insurance because the insurance was not wanting to pay because of the circumstances of the fire. And so <clears throat> she started looking for the very best violin that she could find for four or five hundred dollars and she wasn't having a lot of luck there she was struggling right and then she got to thinking to herself she said you know if I, if I even if i buy this thing like on amazon or ebay or whatever a uh, large part of that money is going to end up going on shipping so wouldn't it be better if i would look for a violin in the area where this lady has moved to right and then i could use all of that money that i've set aside to go toward the violin instead of shipping as well and so she gets to looking in that area and she finds this guy who is a luther that's a guy who builds musical instruments he builds these violins and he builds like these twenty thousand dollar violins right and so um, she begins to pray that god will help her find this find a violin for this lady and so she reaches out to this guy, not because she thinks that she can afford a violin from him, but that maybe because he is into violins and everything, he'll have some idea where she can locate a violin that she can afford in the four to five hundred dollar price range, right? And so uh, she 
emails this guy or whatever. She contacts this guy, and this guy contacts her back, and he says, I'd really like to talk to you. Please call me. And so <clears throat> this lady, I just almost said her name, this, <laughs> this lady calls uh, this guy, and he, she could tell that he was really uh, interested to make sure that the, she tells it, because when she had contacted him, she gave him all of this backstory and everything, and he, she could tell that he was trying to determine if he was really telling that she was really telling the truth, and this is really what she was looking for the violin for and everything. And so finally he said, um, I have this violin that I built, but it ended, and this was part of the deal too that I missed, this lady that played the violin, she was really tiny. So she didn't play a full-size violin, she played like a three-quarter size violin. And, this, and she had told all of this stuff to this guy when she had contacted him. And he, uh, when she called him on the phone, he said, here's the deal. I have this violin that I have made, but it's not really full size. It's not full size, and I have not really known what to do with it. And he said, um, I'm willing to sell that violin to you for $400. Now, remember, this is a guy who makes $20,000 violins. And so uh, this lady was so excited. But then, you know, she's thinking to herself, and she said, um, and this guy on his website, he has like a Christian, he's a Christian. You know, he has posts on their Bible verses and different things and everything. And I'm sure that's part of the reason why he agreed to do this in the first place, right? So... Um, this lady that is now purchasing this violin for $400 is thinking, you know, I don't want the person I'm giving it to to feel really guilty or feel like they're beholden to me or anything. And so she just kind of sent out this thing to, to all of her friends, the friends of this lady that knew her, and said that this is what we're doing. We're going to give her a violin, um, no charge to her, this guy is graciously just willing to, you know, provide it. And anybody that would like to help pay for this, uh, put money toward this violin can do so. And she's, uh, this person that was talking to me said that she received $4,000 that she was able to pay to this luthier, even though he was willing to sell it to her for 400 bucks. And so, you know, here's this lady who has gone through all of this trial and trauma and bad luck who received like this $20,000 violin for free. <laughs> this guy who thought that he was going to give it to her for $400, who ends up getting paid $4,000 for it. And through it all is God who gets the glory. Is that not an amazing, incredible story? I mean... That is one ordinary, everyday person who, because of their conviction in their heart, reached out and said, I want to do something more. You see, it might not be a violin, but that could just as easily be you. Who, just because you love people, reaches out to meet them at their need. You can make a difference. You can be that person that influences so many other people that are around you. If you want. And if you trust God. This morning, if you have a decision that you'd like to make, we invite and encourage you to come as we sing our invitation hymn. Our invitation hymn this morning is hymn number 408, and let's stand and we'll sing the first and final verse, 408. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give, I will ever love. Trust him.
presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Father God, as we come before your throne, I just pray that you would help each and every one of us to live our life committed to you in such a way that no matter what the world throws at us, that we will refuse to be unfaithful. That Heavenly Father, we will love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And as long as there is life and breath in our body, that we will seek to make a difference in this world for you. Watch over us now, direct us, and keep us, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So good. 